Our energy crossroads brings together energy security, national security, economic security, and environmental security. We need to change the way our economy is designed, the way we move around the country, the way we power our economy in a way that's sustainable for 200 years, not just for the next 20. We've got to get on with it. We've got to break the gridlock over this and move forward with the choices, trade-offs, technologies that are required. A clean energy future is a remarkable thing to think about, and, and it exists. It means doing less of the really dirty stuff and doing that first. It means doing more of the clean stuff, and that's using more natural gas in place of coal for now. It means using more renewable energies over time. Renewables have a huge potential, but we have to be realistic. I have to think about how am I going to transition to that at a massive scale. The base is incredibly low which leaves you sitting there scratching your head thinking, wow, we've got a lot of room to really sort of increase that, that renewable footprint. The issue with renewables, the reason they're really unable to take the place in our power generation of these other sources is they're transient. They only generate power when the sun's shining or the wind blows, etc. The intermittency issue is enormous for renewable energy technologies. So while renewables are theoretically limitless, they are not there all the time. So you have to have backup, or you have to have ways of managing the intermittency of wind or solar. One thing you could do is put fast-acting natural gas backups online, whereas the wind dies down or the solar dies down, you ramp up your natural gas in response. So natural gas is really a great partner for renewables because the variability of renewables matches well with the fast response time of natural gas. For moderate emission reductions, natural gas can play a very important role. So you can get 50% reductions in your emissions relative to coal through natural gas. So right away, if you think of a transition where you have targets that are 50% or so, you can do that through natural gas. But still is producing greenhouse gases, still is contributing to the warming of the earth, and if we are going to make an eventual pivot away from these sources of energy so that we really address global warming, we're going to have to move past natural gas too. So sort of a holy grail in the electricity market would be, you know, commercial scale battery technology. If you had that, then all these issues about intermittency go away. The ability to store electricity would allow us to generate more power at night, for example and then simply store the electricity when we don't need it so we can pull it out when we do later in the day. And all of that requires minerals that have to be extracted and processed, batteries that have to be built. That's not a very popular thing <laughs> for people to think about or talk about, but that's actually the case. And as you continue to scale up solar and wind, then really what happens is the true cost of those resources is now not just the cost to install those resources, it's actually the cost to install those resources plus the cost to install the backup. So that gives you a sense of some of the challenges we face, but it means that we need to take a comprehensive approach. It means that you have to be patient, but at the same time it means that if you don't start the ball rolling in a particular direction, you'll never make any progress. We have to develop the technology, we have to sort of have a plan. Long-term R&D effort, like President Kennedy, we're going to the moon, you know, we're gonna solve this energy problem, here's how we're gonna do it. We need to be realistic that we're gonna use fossil fuels now, because in the end, we are. So right now, in our two to five year plan, our focus needs to be on energy efficiency and conservation. Government has to regulate standards of energy efficiency right across the board from cars through appliances to homes. The more difficult part is on the supply side, where we need more renewable energies, and we need to make that work with our existing fossil fuels, and we need to change our networks in order to make that happen. 
as we go forward, we have to continue to think about new types of innovations. These could include smart technology, smart meters, energy delivery technologies, where you have smart appliances in the home that actually can ramp down their load on the system when they're not being utilized. So what that allows us to do is think about energy transitions where we actually continue to achieve the same amount of service that we've always been achieving, but with less energy required. What is at the other end of that transition? Where, where are we going? Where we're going, you hope, is a, a, an energy, a clean energy future where renewables are cheap and highly efficient, where dispersed power, solar, wind, can be driving communities, not just single homes, where nuclear power or natural gas or something on that scale is humming cleanly and cheaply. So that bridge needs to be strong and needs to be serious and needs to be better than what we were doing before. So then we think about how do you move from those greenhouse gas intensive fuels toward a system that's a lower carbon economy. You have to think about the fact that the installed infrastructure for this energy system has been put in place over many, many decades. It's trillions and trillions of dollars. It takes time to turn over that infrastructure. We're at a period of time in the United States where a lot of our infrastructure is, is aging. It's old, particularly in the power generation sector. And some of that older infrastructure is quite frankly due for retirement. So we're, we're sitting at this precipice and we're trying to think about which way to go. Do we move in the direction that we've always been in? Or do we actually start to move in the direction of renewables? When you look at the enormous amount of investments that have been poured into this sector globally, those investors are telling us that they believe these technologies are the future, that they can make money, and that they are the most important business drivers in the energy sector today. I also think a clean energy future is a future where we're using options for, for energy that we don't talk about yet, where we've allowed innovation and people who are, who are driven by their own self-interest to invent new and different ways to power our economy. This is something that's achievable over the time frame of several decades. So we're talking about a goal that you might put in place by the year 2050. But it's one that delivers payoffs much sooner than that. There are steps we take, we become somewhat less vulnerable over time. But in the end, if you want to get to a system that is not putting out carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, that's not dependent on global oil markets, that is a very long time off in the future. You know, in spite of everything, I'm optimistic. Think about 20 or 30 years ago. The world was incredibly different. The technologies were incredibly different. That will happen again. We just need to make sure that that change is directed at transitioning ourselves from a fossil fuel dependent economy to a low carbon economy, and it'll happen. We're just on the cusp of this, and so what we're gonna see over the next 10 years is, is, is a pretty dramatic transition. It is important to recognize that we are all joined here by a common future, and that we need to work together to uh, make it a, a better situation for all of us. It certainly is within our power, it may take some initial sacrifices and patience, in other words, I mean a long-term holistic perspective, but I believe that with sound policy, supported by technology and uh, essentially uh, political will, we can certainly create a better future for our descendants.